Well, here we are with Dr. Gold, a uh, ophthalmologist from Hampton, Connecticut. Hi, Dr. Gold. How is life over there? Excellent. How are you today? Good. Dr. Gold, let me ask you something. You're an ophthalmologist and um, you have a practice. You know, ophthalmologists do a lots of things. In fact, a lots of people out there have a little bit of a confusion. What does an ophthalmologist, an optometrist, and even an optician do? I mean, not that everybody has a confusion. Many people do know it. But... Either way, um, different doctors do do different things. Give us a little bit, a, if you don't mind, a, a, a philosophy of your practice. Like, what is your philosophy about eyesight uh, which you pursue in your practice? And frankly, Dr. Gold, if you don't mind uh, telling us, uh, what made you becoming an ophthalmologist? Uh, you know, what brought you into that type of business? Uh, lots of people I talk to have a... Uh, quite a story connected to it, uh, but whatever it is, I would I would appreciate if you tell us. Well, when I was five years old, I got my first eyeglasses, and it was at that time that I discovered that trees actually have leaves. And anybody out there who's nearsighted can relate to that statement. Um, people who just need reading glasses, like yourself, never really had a problem with their distance vision. The people who were nearsighted or are nearsighted without their glasses or contact lenses, really can't perceive distinct distant objects. So I got my first glasses when I was five years old. I discovered that trees had leaves, and I was intrigued by the things that were done to me at that first eye exam. Then when I, when I re reached medical school a number of years later, the first course that really got me excited was the course in ophthalmology. And I decided at that point to investigate it further, I did that through our teacher, through the residency program at the University of Tennessee Medical School where I was. And I found I really enjoyed ophthalmology, and I was able to use the, the gifts that I was given as a surgeon to help people regain the vision that they either never had or that they had lost for a reason. So I became wow. an ophthalmologist about 35 years ago. I see. Oh, wow. So, so you planned to become uh, to go into the medical field. So that kind of apparently was part of um, your DNA when you were young, and you went into the medical field. But then, as uh, as as in the medical field training, you went through and you started learning about the eyes. That in specifically very interested you, and so you became an ophthalmologist. Exactly. Wonderful. Now, tell us a little bit about your practice, the patients who come to you, what do you tell them, how do you treat them, uh, what do you pay attention to, kind of what's your philosophy in your practice, because I'm very sure that, uh, you know, different doctors in every field um, still have a slightly different philosophy, and it's good for patients to know, you know, what they can expect. Well, let's go back a little bit to your earlier question about the differences between opticians, optometrists, and ophthalmologists. The simplest is opticians, and what they do is they make eyeglasses for people. The next level of training up is optometry, and they are trained to examine eyes, and in some places around the country, to actually treat some eye disease. And then there are ophthalmologists who are MDs, gone to medical school, done an internship, and then surgical residency, to learn to treat everything about the eye, both with medicine and with surgery. That's what I am, an ophthalmologist, and I am skilled to treat all sorts of eye disease, diagnose and treat all sorts of eye disease. As I went through my career, I found that the thing that intrigued me the most was refractive surgery, which started in the early 90s, generally in this country, with radio keratotomy procedure that was performed, changing the shape of the cornea with the diamond scalp. And that became supplanted when lasers were developed that could change the shape of the front surface of the eye in order to change where the light rays focus inside the eye, thereby eliminating the glasses. So the lasers were approved by the FDA in 1995 to be used for vision correction surgery in otherwise healthy eyes. And I was involved in the second laser center in the country to do that when I was practicing out in Salt Lake City. And I learned how to do a procedure called PRK, which is phototherapeutic peritectomy, 
which involves no cutting whatever of the eye in order to change its vision. Within about two years after that, uh, there was a development of a procedure in which the cornea was cut, and it was called LASIK, laser-assisted insight to keratomalicious, in which the cornea was cut, the flap was folded back, and the laser then changed the shape of the third layer in the cornea in order to affect where the light rays focused on the retina. And the flap keeps sealed back in place overnight, but it turned out there was a, uh, a study released earlier this year, in 2011, that indicates that that flap never completely healed. So LASIK patients can be subject, if they get hit in the eye, just the wrong way for the rest of their lives, for the flap to become loosened. And if that happens, they're in big trouble, potentially. I can see. About four years ago, a an update of the PRK procedure that could be done with a mechanical device just to take off the first layer of the cornea with no cutting and then change the shape of the second layer. That procedure is a modern version of PRK. And there's no cutting involved, which makes it a much safer procedure. There are a number of doctors around the country, including myself now, who will no longer do LASIK because of the safety limit themselves to this new version of PRK, which is called epi-lasic, because all we take off is the epithelium. And it's a procedure which can produce higher quality vision than LASIK. It does take a little bit longer for the vision to reach that quality, so there's a three-day recovery period as opposed to just overnight. But during that three days, activities are not restricted at all. The eyes are covered with a special contact lens, that allows the epithelium to grow back smoothly, which is the key to recovery of that procedure. And there is less dry eye produced. There's certainly more safety because there's no cutting. Better quality of vision, because all we have to do is to get the epithelium to feel smooth. That's a piece of cake with the contact lenses. And there's less loss of tissue, because we can take away the tissue with the laser. And the second layer down, there is less tissue removal than in the third layer. So I have come exclusively to doing epi-LASIK over the last several months, probably since the beginning of 2011. Right. My, results are My results are better, the patients are happier, and they're clearly safer. So basically, patients who need LASIK um, are the type of people you see and um, you really don't now, you know, fix anything else. But um, what about people who come in and they don't necessarily know they need LASIK because it's your examination or an ophthalmologist's examinations which will determine that. Um, so can people come in, you examine them, and if they need LASIK, you do it. And uh, if they don't, then they go somewhere else. How does that work? For sure. I do general eye exams, just like every other ophthalmologist does. And if I find a patient, for example, with glaucoma or with cataracts, I have a network of colleagues that I can refer these people to. And if they come from me as a referral, they get in much more quickly than if they just call somebody else who has a higher volume of practice than them. Right. And um, so what about a person comes in with an examination and he really doesn't need any type of surgery as such, but he might need uh, glasses, he might need lenses, whether it's far sight, near sight, reading, whatever it might be, um, uh, you, you know, might need other type of stuff. How, how would that get fixed in your uh, uh, practice, uh, Dr. Gold? Well, I still prescribe glasses for people who need glasses and don't want surgery. And simple contact lens fittings, I still do. If the contact lens fitting is complicated by astigmatism, then I have one particular friend that I refer those patients to. He's an expert in fitting basically back in contact lens. Mm. So what I really see and hear from you here is that you seem to have a belief that you say, look, uh, the health and the eye, of course, are uh, very, 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 very important. Um, you know, while we don't want to lose a little toe and a little finger, but losing an eye is just a little more severe. 
Um, so in any case, um, it is worth it to go and get it fixed by a guy that that's what he does. Um, rather than try to be, even though an eye is a relatively small part of our whole body, um, it, you know, there are several glaucoma and, um, and cataracts and the, the, the LASIK and the other things. And, um, and what you want to do is really get the patient to a guy who is super good at what that patient needs. It, that seems to be a belief of yours from what I hear here. Am I right here or wrong? No, you're absolutely correct. I think that in order to be really good at doing what you do, you should do a lot of it. Right. You don't do a, like, you don't do a lot of that particular procedure. You're probably not as good as the next guy who mm -hmm. does a lot. Right. And I, I strongly feel that patients should be taken care of by the person who's the best at what he does. Right. And I strongly, I strongly believe that I'm the best LASIK surgeon there is in the state because that's all I do. Got it. I got it. So, um, despite the fact you see the whole world to a certain degree is talking about all under one house, all under one roof. And while that has, has definitely some advantages sometimes, because, you know, patients, be it a dentist or, uh, or whatever, they, they don't want to go to six specialists or to six other doctors doing it if they don't have to. Um, but, and, and as I said, it has some advantages, but you know, we're talking the eyes here, we're talking something very, very specific. That little hassle of having to get your butt to another person's office if needed, uh, is what you say is well worth it because you're dealing with something, if it is messed up, it ruins your life. I think that's correct. And even in the large group practices where there are a number of ophthalmologists, one specializing in LASIK, another specializing in retina, another specializing in glaucoma. What happens is if you see one of the general ophthalmologists, they find a problem of cataracts, for example. Right. And it, what has to happen is you have to make another appointment to come back on a different day to see the cataract specialist. So even though it's in the same building, it's not all at the same time. Mm -hmm. So... Obviously, there's a purpose behind specialization, and um, um, you know I can see why. You know, you don't want to get your uh, um, whatever it is. You don't want to get your uh, your stomach taken out by a hairdresser, and you don't want to have a a, a a surgeon who replaces hips um, fixing your flat screen TV. I guess <laughs> it's maybe a little far fetched, but um, something in that neighborhood, I suppose, right? Those are those are good analogies. Okay. Well, Dr. Gold, thank you very much um, for explaining us what you're all about. Um, it's wonderful to see somebody who obviously, when you make the decision to go into the eye uh, field, uh, doesn't look like you have regretted it simply because you're still in, still enthusiastic about it, um, still learning, still specializing, and uh, that's wonderful. Thank you very much. Thank you.